Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Sunday morning service. I pray and hope and trust that you are all doing well um, as you join us online uh, for this Sunday morning service. I want to begin uh, from uh, Psalm 11 and just the first three verses of Psalm 11, and you'll see how it'll be pertinent to what I'm going to be saying in the in the main message. So. Psalm 11 and verses 1 through 3. I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we pause before you now, we invite you into this service and we thank you for your presence. We thank you that your word is true. We thank you that we have an anchor to hold on to. We thank you that you warn us about all of the things that we need to be aware of as these days become darker, as this uh, society that we live in becomes increasingly wicked. Father, thank you for giving us something to hold on to. You are the rock. Jesus is the rock. The Holy Spirit dwelling within us anchors us to you. And so we thank you for the blessing of this. We invite you into this message now and pray that your words will come through me in order to to teach the people, but more importantly, to bring glory to your name. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite Brother... Brother Ben up shortly, and he's going to be reading to us this morning from Isaiah 5 and 1 Timothy 4, and also from Matthew 25. Thanks, Ben. Morning, everyone. Really great to be here with you again and to be uh, reading these verses to you, and even better to see uh, Chris and hear his message this week. So I'll I'll start with Isaiah 5, uh, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The next one from 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical lies whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. And lastly, Matthew 25, 1-13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all become drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil and our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The uh, the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Wow, some strong words there. So uh, this is the word of the Lord, and we'll get Chris back to share his message for this week. I can't wait to hear what it is. It's going to be uh, a powerful one. So listen up. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, I hope it will be a powerful one. It's my intention. It certainly is. So I'm here this morning to uh, talk to you about the Word of God and in particular how the Word of God is the only means we have at our disposal to make sense out of an insane world. So this is what has been pressing on my heart over the last 12 months or so and the crux of the matter 
can be framed in the words of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 1. The Bible says, and Ezekiel is speaking, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. Now that's what God called Ezekiel, the son of man, and there's only one other person in the Bible who is actually labelled with that label, son of man, and that was Jesus when he walked on the face of the earth. So it says, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will be required at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made your watchman for the house of Israel, therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. And in many ways that's what I am doing here this morning, is, is giving a warning but also an encouragement. So uh, listen for both. And of course, it is a recognised truism in most evangelical Christian circles that God has made of all of his children watchmen in the sense that we are all to preach the gospel and uh, to warn them and to tell people that there is only one name under heaven by whom we can be saved. And that name is, of course, the name of Jesus. And we are to warn people that God will not forever wink at sin but that in the future he will bring judgment upon the earth and that a person's eternity will be determined on the basis of whether they heeded the warning and whether they called upon the name of Jesus to receive salvation and to save them from the coming wrath. So do you feel the burden of the watchman? Because you should. Because if we don't tell people, if we don't warn them, then we will have blood on our hands. You see, the age in which we live, I just want to share with you this morning, with all that's going on in the world today, we can sense that time is running out. Our governments all around the world are at an ever-increasing pace, dismantling all that is good, all that is moral, all that is pleasing to God himself. And it has always been this way, but oh, how the pace has picked it up, how it has increased uh, and quickened in the last year or so. So our nations currently have no moral compass anymore. There's barely anyone left to give voice to what is right and good, barely anyone saying you can't do that because that's wrong, because number one, people are afraid to say it. You know, we have been uh, completely beaten down by the culture, by the, by the world around us. Cancel culture is absolutely rife. And we've allowed ourselves to be beaten down. And we might then ask ourselves, well, why have our nations lost the, their moral compass? Why is there no moral compass left in the world anymore? Where is the compass? Where should the compass be? Where has it been in the past? In that great sermon on the mount, Jesus talking about salt and light, he said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you see, the church is the compass. It has always been the compass. It ought to be now and it ought to be moving into the future. But the truth is, the church has gone quiet. It has been silent. It has been that way for a very long time. And so with the church having gone quiet, the compass of our modern world is no longer pointing in the right direction. And increasingly, people no longer look to the church to provide that moral anchor that keeps our world from spinning out of control. The church is, if you haven't realised it, now completely irrelevant in this country and in most Western nations around the world. Indeed, generally speaking, churches today are more committed to being cool and acceptable to being liked by the world 
all this in the hope that somehow secular people will be attracted and come in through the door, um, that they'll be more inclined to, to turn up on Sunday morning. Or they, churches may have turned inward, that's the opposite effect, closing themselves off from the world in the hope that corruption will not seep in. But then COVID came along and we closed our churches for a time and many churches simply did not reopen. And perhaps that's a good thing because many of those churches needed to close. And that may sound terribly harsh, but listen, when you don't teach the Bible and give people what they need to live a life that accords with the Bible, what the Bible talks about, if you don't give people the tools from God's word in order for them to be able to fight the good fight, to stand up and be counted, then when the war comes, and it's coming, then those people have nothing to anchor them. They will almost certainly fold. They will almost certainly fall into the hands of the enemy. Now, I'm using the analogy of war here because that is what is actually happening. We are, in fact, in a war. We are in a war for the souls of people. We are in a war for a worldview that values the things of God. And it's interesting that next Sunday it's going to be Anzac Day here in Australia, a day in which we remember the sacrifice of many who fought and many who gave up their lives in order to preserve a particular way of life, to preserve the very freedoms that so many now appear to be very willing to give up without a fight. So folks, we are living on borrowed time. We have been living off of the hard work of those generations that came before us and we've been coasting along on the momentum of those who came before. Now, I believe many of them would be absolutely ashamed at, at the amount of ground that we have surrendered in this world, and this includes the ground that we have lost in the church. You may not realise this, but the throttle was let off a long time ago, and the church began to be compromised. The church began to be more concerned about internal concerns rather than the things of God. And it became more concerned about how it looked to the outside world rather than on being an example, on being a moral compass to the world. And the first victim of all of this was the doctrine of God's word, the teaching of the Bible. And so churches then began to craft five steps to a happy life type sermons and they stopped talking about sin, they stopped talking about repentance, about the cross of Christ, and because their light had gone out, their candlestick was removed. Because there was no longer a witness, there was no longer a light set on a hill in order to shine God's light into the spiritual darkness of this world. So let me just pause here and add that I personally am very grateful that some churches have bucked this trend and that some churches still have pulpits that still preach the gospel and in fact this church is one of them we need to be very grateful for our teaching ministry here led by our pastor Johnson it's one of very few places that have a gospel centered preaching ministry and so this is very very good however it is not nearly enough you and I live in a world that unless God touches a handful of believers, unless he preserves a remnant of faithful believers, it's over. Unless the church seeks the face of God, we are done. And we know that a remnant of faithful believers will exist and must always exist because God tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. God is faithful to keep a handful of faithful believers and for this, we ought to be truly grateful. And so the church needs to have courage. And she needs to know what it is that she believes. Jesus is coming back soon for his bride. And the Bible says that she will be wearing fine linen, clean and bright. That means she is pure. So when he comes back and he's coming back soon, he's coming back for a pure church. A church that is anchored firmly in the promises and the morality of God's word. This is a church that takes seriously the calling which she has been given. And it can also be said that individuals within the church, that's you, or, you and I, we also need to soberly take up the mantle which has been given to us. And uh, so this calling is both collective and individual at the same time. But by and large, we need to understand that the church has been compromised. 
And what does a compromised church do when things get worse, which it will? 2020 was a difficult year for most of us and 2021 is shaping up to be no improvement. Now, I want you to look at the bigger picture here. The events of the last year have swept through the world, testing people, testing local councils, testing state and federal governments, testing leadership at all levels, testing uh, businesses, testing families, testing marriages, testing relationships, testing reality, and testing our mental health. And it has tested the church. And it has tested the faith of so many, including pastors. And this is just when the water is still only running a few inches deep. So what is going to happen when the dam breaks? Pick a topic, almost any topic. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled today, be it wars and rumours of wars, wars, be it natural disasters, be it a one world religion, be it the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution, be it a cashless monetary system, be it the rise in apostasy in the church. God has anticipated all of this with his prophetic word. So you need to understand, and something very important, you need to understand we will never return to the normal that we used to know a little over a year ago. Now you might ask, how do I know this? Because the World Economic Forum and most of our leaders in government worldwide will not allow it. And if that should fizzle out, if all this COVID stuff fizzles out, don't worry, they will find another crisis. And you might say, well, Pastor, that all sounds really uh, fantastical. That all sounds like conspiracy theory. And I say, really? You know, just head on over to the World Economic Forum website, will you? It can be found at weforum.org slash great reset. Okay, just go onto their website, search for great reset. You will find everything there. It's all laid out in plain sight. And they say things like, you will own nothing and you will be happy. The November 2020 issue of Time magazine carried a front cover article talking all about it. It was emblazoned with the words, Great Reset. So I'm not making this stuff up. It's coming. Listen, the Bible says that there is a coming economic reset, Revelation 13. And when the World Economic Forum, governments and financial institutions all around the world tell us that an economic reset is just around the corner, and they are, then all of a sudden... Bible prophecy starts to really come alive, doesn't it? It really starts to get some traction. Do you know the times in which you live? If you're reading and studying your Bible, then everything that I am saying to you now will be starting to resonate loudly with you. If not, then I urge you, before it is too late, to get familiar with your Bible and what it says about what is going on all around us. And if you have had your head buried in the sand, then I urge you to pop your head back up and take a look around because a lot has changed since you went under. Jesus said, at the time of the end, the love of many will grow cold. And when that happens, lawlessness will abound. Do you believe the words of Jesus? That's exactly what we see in the world today. It's straight out of Isaiah 5, which Ben read from us, read, read earlier. A day in which evil is called good, and good is called evil. Light is called dark, and dark is called light. Bitter is called sweet, and sweet is called bitter. It's completely satanic. The Bible says that in the last days it is going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Boys are called girls, girls are called boys. Truth is called lies, and lies are called truth. Listen, remember that Satan traffics in confusion. He traffics in confusion. We need to reconnect. If we aren't already, we need to reconnect with God's truth. And I'm going to be talking a lot more about uh, what truth is uh, next week. First Timothy 4.1, Ben also read this to us, very important verse. This is a warning to us in the church, which says, the spirit explicitly says that in the latter days, some will fall away from the faith and pay attention to deceitful spirits and demonic doctrines. Oh, how true that is. That day has come. It is already here. Now think about it. Just think about this for a moment. 
It was inevitable that one day the world would catch up with the very the, the world would catch up with the very things that God foretold millennia ago. The word of God is absolutely sure. It cannot fail. Why? Because it is backed up by an all-powerful and an, and an infallible God. God says that he is looking for men and women who tremble at his word. So are we that kind of people? Because we should be. God is cleaning up his church today. He is shaking the tree, and it's going to be very interesting to see how many nuts fall out. Let me refer you to the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Now, I find this incredibly intriguing that half of the virgins in this parable were not ready. This parable is talking about the church. It can only be the church. It refers to the bridegroom, Jesus, and his bride, the church. Now, I don't know if the percentage here, 50%, is being literal or not, but it could well be. But the lesson here is that a significant portion of these virgins were not ready. That's the lesson. So do you see, it's time to wake up, church. It's time to get ready. And if you want to get really woke, as the culture now likes to say, then you need to get into the word of God and know what it actually says. I believe this will be the next step. All of the things I've been talking about this morning, the next wave of the church, is about the church being purified. So are we going to take up the challenge? Are we going to, or are we going to fold? Are we going to listen to what the world and what secular people say and what they tell us to think and what they tell us to say ourselves? Or are we going to stand holding fast, knowing what God says and what he thinks? Who or what is going to dictate your worldview? Who or what is going to dictate your feelings or the feelings of other people? I'm asking you, don't let the world determine the stand that you will take. You've got to know what ground that you are standing on because the dam is going to break and the world cannot save you. Only God can save you. And as God's people, just like Ezekiel, we need to blow the trumpet. But how can we blow the trumpet if we don't know why we're blowing it and what we're warning people about? It's a bit like being a technician at a geological monitoring station. You know, the lights are blinking on and off and you see the alarms going off. The ground is shaking and you get on the phone to the authorities and you say, look, I've got something of very critical importance to tell you. And they say, well, let's have it then. And you say, well, I don't know what to tell you. I can't interpret what's going on. Uh, all I know is that something is going wrong and I'm pretty sure that these flashing lights and these loud sirens are actually all a part of that and uh, are a sign of what is happening. You see, if you were a skilled and experienced technician, then you would know what it all meant. And you would be warning everyone to evacuate out of harm's way because the dam is about to break. So likewise, we need to learn to be skilled technicians of God's word. We need to be firmly established in his word because that is the only place in which we can decipher what is really going on and to discover the end from the beginning. So we need to make a decision as to where we're going to go to look for and where we're going to place our own worldview. Is it going to be in God's word? Is it going to be in his instruction, in his promises? It had better be, because the other choice is that you will find that this world will completely hammer us into submission. You need to believe that this world, and increasingly so, is going to become more and more hostile to Christianity. We've never really faced any kind of persecution in this country, you know, for our faith. But they've been uh, persecuted, Christians have been persecuted for decades all around the world and other countries. Countries like Nigeria, China, Pakistan, Iran, and many other places. Indeed, one of the hallmarks of the Christian church is persecution. So how did they stand in the past? How do they stand today? They did so and they do so on the sure word of God and the promises contained therein. The question is then, do we? I hope so, because it is the only way in which we will remain standing. Let me ask you this. 
This world has lost its attractiveness. It's lost its luster, hasn't it? The only acceptable answer to that question is yes. If it has, it's because we have fixed our attention on the things of heaven and not on the things of this world, not on the things of this earth. But if this world still glitters for you, today is the day that you can and should change that. What we need to do is live for God, listening attentively to his words, every word of it true, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible. This is how we will take our stand. But remember, there is going to be a cost. There is always a cost. Jesus warned us there was a cost. He said that if we love him and if we follow him, then we are going to be hated by this world. So how do we survive all of this? We do this we do all of that by resting in the hands of God, by looking to him, trusting in him, leaning on his sure promises that he has proclaimed to us in many, many books called the Bible. Some of you may be feeling perhaps a little bit anxious about hearing this message, but there's no need to feel anxious, no need to feel afraid. Anchor yourself in the word of God because the word of God says perfect love casts out all fear. It also says, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is to come upon the earth. So we need to become firmly grounded in his word because his word is truth. It fills us with hope and it can anchor us in a world which is already drowning or soon will be. And like Noah, like Noah, we need to sound the alarm so that others might be saved and to climb on board the precious ark of our salvation to be found only in Jesus Christ, the living word of God. Amen. Amen. So I just want to conclude by talking about something that we are doing here in this church. A few weeks ago, uh, Reverend Russell Clark spoke about spiritual gifts and talents, about identifying these and moreover offering these uh, within the church to help build up and to edify the body of Jesus Christ. So we want 2021 to be the year in which everyone is able to find their place in the church, exercising their gifts to bless one another and, of course, to glorify God. And in a similar way, this year is also one in which we want to offer our people an opportunity to go much deeper in the word of God than perhaps they've ever done before. And so in the near future, we will be offering an in-depth Bible study, and we're still working out the mechanics of that, and uh, there will probably be one here in the church in the evening during the week. And we're also looking to do a parallel online study if we can work out some of the uh, logistical challenges in order to make that happen. So these studies are not for the faint of heart. And by that I mean that we will be getting out the pick and the shovel and we will be digging. We will be digging hard and we will be digging deep. It'll be work and it may involve homework. Well, maybe. But it will require participation and a lot of thinking by anyone who chooses to become involved. But I can assure you that it will be worth it because you will come out the other side of it knowing far more than when you went in and you will feel that you have the confidence to apply the skills that you will pick up on the way to your own Bible study. You know, whatever book, whatever time, you will be ready and able to look at it deeply. The word of God will come alive to you and you will fall in love with it again, all over again. So let me encourage you to get involved in this and if I have succeeded at all in piquing your interest, your curiosity, or even if you're not sure but you might be interested, then please, I'm talking to people who are online here and I don't know whether you come to the church or not, but let's assume that you don't. You're, you're an online person, you're remote somewhere. Please send us an email to express your interest. And I'm going to ask if Ben could uh, post our email address on the end of the video in order to help you with that because we may be able to provide you an online Bible study service. That's something we would like to be able to do. If we can work out the kinks, that's something we're looking to achieve. So the dam is about to burst. We need to be anchored. What ground are you standing on? And how will you discern a proper understanding of this insane world that we now live in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, remain in me, Jesus said, 
and I will remain in you. We have a decision to make because apparently, as Jesus has indicated, we can wander away from him. He urges us to remain in him because, as he goes on to say, apart from me, you can do nothing. By immersing ourselves in your written word, we can know your heart. And we can remain in Christ, the living word. This is how we can have life, abundant life, and participate effectively in your kingdom work. We thank you and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've come to the time when we uh, normally uh, talk about and bless uh, the offering. And so I just first of all want to uh, give my personal thanks and, and the thanks of uh, a grateful church uh, for all of the rich blessings that we have received over the last weeks and months. Uh, we've found that our online giving is up. And this is fantastic because uh, this work doesn't come free. We like to offer it for free, but, and we will always offer it for free. But in order to achieve it, to keep the lights on, to, keep, to be able to do these recordings, it does cost. And so we thank you for your generosity and uh, we pray that God will bless you accordingly. So let's uh, take up your offering wherever you happen to be. And uh, at the end of the video, of course, we post uh, where you can actually credit uh, our bank account and uh, other information. We now have a, uh, a new uh, mechanism uh, called Tithely and uh, that may be more convenient for some of you. So thank you, and let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for the, for, for the opportunity to do what we do here. We want to thank you for the mantle that you have given us, to be participants in your kingdom work. We want to thank you for the gifts that you give us personally, and the ability for us to in turn return those gifts back to your kingdom work whether it be in a monetary form, whether it be with our gifts and talents, Lord, all of these are for your glory. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to be a part of all of this. So we thank you. We pray that you'll multiply these gifts to your service in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we've come to the end of our service and I pray and hope that you were encouraged, uplifted, challenged, all of the above. And uh, again, I remind you, if you'd like to be a part of a, a Bible study in the future, please sign up and uh, we'll be in touch with you and, and give you more information as it comes to hand. So thank you and uh, let's close the service in prayer and a benediction. Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for our time together. We thank you that you were here present with us. We thank you that we have been called to participate with you in a great work. We pray that you will protect us and bless us as we leave our places of uh, our homes and our places of work, wherever they may be. And as we come together and gather in whatever form that may be, whether it's in the local church or whether it's in our homes in a Bible study or whatever form, Lord, we, we, we are involved in with our families and friends. Lord, we pray that you will be present and protect us in those things. We commit ourselves to you with grateful thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let, me, amen. let me leave you with the blessing. <laughs> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep us now and forevermore. Amen.